and welcome to the Mime Radio Show. I am not Karen Hoyer. And I am not James Donlan. We are Keith Berger and Sharon Diskin, guest hosts for today's program. Our producer, Michael Diaz, is here with us today. Well, seeing as it would be rather awkward to interview yourself, we were very honored to be invited to interview one of the creators of Mime Radio and an extraordinary artist in his own right, the one and only James Donlan. James has been a celebrated international performer, master teacher, and director of mime and physical theater since 1970. For the last 51 years, Donlan has performed his original solo programs throughout North America, Europe, and Latin America to wildly enthusiastic audiences. He's the first American mime clown to perform in the famed Teatro Dimitri of Switzerland, and the New York Times has called Donlan's work an extraordinary blend of skill and lunacy. To see a really interesting timeline of his work, please do check out his website, jamesdonlan.com. <clears throat> He's also been on the faculties of many acting schools, including the American Conservatory Theater, the University of North Carolina School of the Arts, the National Theater Conservatory Denver Center, the Yale School of Drama, UC Santa Barbara, UC San Diego, and the Oregon Center for the Arts. In addition, he has presented residencies with special institutions like El Teatro Campesino, Mexico City's Bellas Artes, Prague's National Academy of Performing Arts, and Dublin's Gaiety School of Acting. He was film movement coach for Oscar winners Javier Bardem, Kathy Bates and Francis McDormand. He also created TV fight choreography for Linda Ronstadt. Among his former students are legendary Broadway musical star Terrence Mann and Tony Award winner Bill Irwin. And most recently, he, Karen Hoyer, and Michael Diaz have created Mime Radio, which has become an incredible archive of interviews featuring mime and physical theater performers from around the world whose careers have spanned over five decades. In fact, we all owe him and the rest of the team a huge debt of gratitude for this invaluable document. And this interview is just the latest. So without further ado, we'd like to welcome James Donlan. Uh, wow. <laughs> That's a lot of years. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thanks Hi. a lot. That was really nice of you, Sharon, to share that. Well, it's it's all you. Yeah. I first met uh, James, uh, you, James, uh, when I was, it was in the early 70s, and I was performing street mime in Washington Square Park. And um, I was doing something, I'm not quite sure what it was, but this uh, very handsome young irish looking guy comes in and starts performing with me and um at first i was kind of alarmed because <laughs> he was really good uh, but then i got into it and afterward we met up and uh had dinner and talked about this stuff and uh we're talking about it still years and years later yeah that's great yeah, actually, I remember what you were doing. You were doing the classic pull the rope and you threw it <clears throat> near my audience area. And I just, uh, right. I was in New York City studying modern dance with Alan Nikolai. And I was right. like, how old was I? Maybe 23, 24. I think that was what I was. And the rope came and I just, as a as a inf inflex or instinct, I just grabbed it when you pulled on it and I came out of the audience. That's how, That's what we did. <laughs> I think we just kind of played around with the rope for a bit. Yeah. We did. It seemed like, as I recall, it was a pretty big audience too. Pretty, pretty oh yeah, in those days. Yeah. Oh, you must have had. You might have had over a hundred people in a circle around you, maybe more. Yeah. You know? so, yeah. yeah a big so audience. Give us an idea of the of the time period. What year was that? Probably would I would think 1971, 1970. Yeah, but it's around for yeah. me. I think it was 73, but somewhere around there. But um, uh -huh. yeah, that those were that was the golden years of busking of street performance across the country. Well, yeah. not everywhere, but especially in San Francisco and New York. 
Yeah. So they, yeah. they were um, people on the streets doing everything, you know, right. very yeah. special. But those yeah. days are kind of gone now in the United States, at least, you know. Alas, they have gone. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's interesting. Um, I never did perform in the street. I mean, a lot of mimes and clowns and comedians and musicians did in the early parts of their career. I only did it maybe once. But I was lucky right. enough to always be in a theater, you know, right. either on tour or at a university. So that my aesthetic was developed in a th terms of a theater craft more than this surviving on the streets, which is a really special, you know, experience and craft. How you how you learn to do that? Yeah, it's part hustle. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. the thing, you know. Yeah, it's part art and part hustle. You know. Yeah, it's a little bit. I don't, don't take this wrong, but it's a little bit maybe like being a lounge singer, like because people yeah. are passing by and yeah. You know, all kinds of characters that can wander in or out and you have to just swing with it and you can't go on too long. I think you have to keep, I mean, I sh you should be the one explaining what you do, but um, no, no, that's okay. I've, I've yeah. seen a lot of it. Yeah. yeah. No, you can't go on too long. That's not yeah. a good thing. But yeah. this was a going to Sharon's uh, point about what year, what time period, this was the early seventies. So we'd just come out of the sixties and right. I was a college student in the late sixties. And yeah. for me, I feel lucky that I actually was a college student in the 60s because it was such a charge, the late 60s particularly, was such a charged decade with so many world events, good and bad, happening. We had assassinations. We had, you know, our, we had uh, the Vietnam War. We had drugs. We had, you know, the moon landing. Um, it, you know, wh whatever week came, something new would happen. And it really stimulated your mind yeah. In terms of curiosity and, and mime is such an art form that it is such a an art form of the people. What I mean by that, that it can, mm -hmm. you know, it draws itself from humanity itself. And, and unfortunately, I think some of that is being lost in today's younger mimes, but we can talk about that later. But um, okay. this influence of the 60s was incredible, you know, yeah. in terms of what your themes were, you know, you you know, we did some, th some, my partner, Bob, and I would do some th very political things in the beginning. And that was wow. normal for the thoughtful things, you know, not just illusions yeah. of magic. Talk about your partner. Who was this? This is Bob Francisconi, who was my original partner. We were college students at Humboldt State University. Wow. About, you know, the 60s. Okay. And it was behind the Redwood Curtain. We used to call that part of the lost north coast of California, the Redwood Curtain. And um, it was a very special place to be a college student. Right. So Bob and I were both in the theater department. He was a local guy who had returned home. He had gone his first year to Loyola in uh, L.A. And he didn't like the, uh, besides watching the airplanes on the at the Howard Hughes Airport there, you know, out there by Loyola University. Yeah. He uh, decided to come back to Humboldt State. So mm -hmm. we teamed up and he was my first partner for a few years. And then eventually he became the assistant dean and um, the movement and mask and director, device theater teacher at North Carolina School of the Arts, where he spent 35 years, you know, of a very noted career. And we're still wow. in contact. That's great. Let's go back a little bit. Um, I was sort of taken with your story about uh, how you were an athlete uh, of certain ability and prowess growing up. And I wanna, wanted to find out how did that inform or translate into your life as a physical theater artist? Uh, that's a great Great question. You know, it informed uh, so much for me. You know, first of all, I have a chipped tooth. I have a scar uh, here. I have a broken finger. Um, I have a broken arm. I have metal in my arm. So anybody that plays, you know, organized sports on a high level, um, you know, has physical ailments and physical experiences. So mime, of course, physical theater is about the body and ideas. So um this regimen that i was obsessed with as a youngster i was a high school basketball player i grew up in a small town uh camarilla which was a just an agricultural 
little dot on the map close to LA, but the only popular theater at that time was theater. I mean, it was uh, sports probably. So I became a basketball player because first of all, you could do it by yourself. All you mm -hmm. needed was a ball and a hoop in the backyard or on the asphalt. And I became obsessed with this sense of space and time and just that action. So I became a very good shooter and I'm not very tall, but I could really jump. I could dunk a basketball when I was 16, 17. I'm only about 5'10". I was 5'11". You know, we all shrink, you know, eventually. <laughs> but um, and then I went to college to play at Humboldt State. Um, wow. And uh, I played my first three years there. Mm. I broke my arm in a game there. But wow. eventually the business of more higher level of college sports kind of got to me and I actually stopped playing in the middle of my senior year when I was actually one of the important players on the team. I just, you might say I quit, which was um, not so crazy at that time because it was crazy times. Vietnam was everywhere. Yeah. You know, you had to stay in school to stay out of the draft if, you know, and that, maybe that didn't save you. And, um, you know, everybody was confused. and Everybody was uh, in the streets burning their draft cards. And uh, marijuana was an LSD with the big new mental um, illusions and provocative, you know, stimulants that you could have for your imagination. So that that uh, regimen and that base of basketball really informed my sense of movement. And it, and then the other thing that's interesting is when you play in a game, it's like performing because a crowd for a basketball game is the same as a crowd for a good theater event. You know, you, you almost could say that the NFL is the popular theater of the USA. You know, that's some good elements of that, some bad elements of that, but professional sports, are really an important element in American culture. Yeah. And so that connection of audience and energy and sound and in sports, you call it the zone where you get in the trance, you get in the the hip, hip, uh, the place of hypnotism, not only with yourself, but with the audience. In fact, a friend of ours, Avner, the eccentric, you know, I think he's a trained hypnotist. So, and he's, you know, one of the world's best clowns. So there's, connection of the moment and the witnesses and the journey of the imagination gets into this place that you can't really, you know, this spontaneous moment, you can't know what's going to happen next. You have a strategy, like a, a mind piece or a play, you know, you have the script, that's your strategy. In sports, you have your, 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 your plays, your schemes, but you always depart from that. And whoever is good in theater and whoever is good in sports is able to find that freedom within between the lines. So the sports, besides giving me a strong body and a athletic body, really helped me mentally too to approach the stage in in many ways that I could talk about forever. If you get me started on this this well, athletic thing, because I I am still obsessed by basketball even though I don't play anymore. Well. So. Uh, so let's still uh, be on those early years. Uh, yeah. What was your approach to mime, you know, creating mime in those days? And how would you say it has evolved over over time? That's very interesting. Um, well, first of all, for me, mime has always been an athletic event. Okay. It's an aggressive event, not in terms of beating somebody or dominating somebody, but an athletic event aggressive event in attacking space. So Francisconi and I used to perform a lot in high school gymnasiums, as we all did early in the days, right? Yeah. I remember one experience in Sacramento, one of our first performances, maybe 1971, we had seven assemblies in a row in the gymnasium with the kids, you know, coming in and out, right, for mm -hmm. each period. And we didn't get paid much, but I remember it was a cathartic experience because, first of all, the gymnasium was a very friendly place for me, but we would attack space. So we had an advantage. You know, he was an athlete, too. He played football, I think, and baseball, but I don't think he did. So we would – this idea of you know uh, uh, being aggressive in space came very easy to us, and we enjoyed it. We enjoyed the sweat, okay, and the – you know, you felt drained. Um, when you were finished. So um, this, this uh, um, 
Here, remind me again. What was the first question? I'm starting to get a feel here a little bit. What was it? You said so what? You're answering the first question by telling me, hey, you're, uh, how did your approach to mime begin? Uh -huh. How has it evolved? Yeah. yeah. So it's very aggressive, athletic. You know, eventually I learned backflips and gymnastics on stage, and I could juggle five elements. You know, mm -hmm. later on, we might talk about what's the difference between a clown and a, a theater clown and a mime. I think they're the same. We, we'll talk about that later, perhaps. But um, so there was all these physical feats, but yet the 60s had informed the idea of, of um, story and uh, politics and social issues. So there was mm -hmm. a, we were always complimented on our ideas. You know, we had our anti-war piece. We had our anti-pollution piece. We had our absurd pieces. Um, so some people have heard me say this before. For, so for me, the the life of the physical theater performer is, is like what's contained in an hourglass with the sand, the two chambers. And when you're young, the physical um, is in the bottom, right? All the sand is in the bottom and the, and the mental, which is the top, is empty, right? Yeah. So as life <laughs> begins, you turn the hourglass over or the life glass over and the physical starts to drain and drain and drain so that as you go through the years, the physical diminishes. But what's happening magically, the the mental is filling up, is filling up, is filling up. So my feeling is, as you go through the years, your, your uh, mental approach and your sense of economy of gesture and ideas becomes much more acute. And you don't have to do as many physical things. You know, eventually, what do we do? We just throw it over our shoulder and the sand truck comes and you go off to the next dimension, right? But um, so for myself, I've had to, and I'm really feeling it now, I'm in my 70s now and I still perform. Some people say I'm performing better than ever, which is very interesting to me. Sometimes I have to be reminded, like I know the experience I had in your front room a year or two ago where you said, slow down. I was showing you a piece, an old piece and some new ones. And you said, James, slow down. Even in the old piece, slow down, slow down. So as you go through the years, you become this kind of robotic, automatic, everything's so familiar. And maybe your mind is going off into another imaginary place and you forget the craft sometimes of the nuts and bolts. So, um, you know, so it's always good to return to this to this sense of concentration that at, in time that starts to slip because you're so used to doing what you're doing, you know, it becomes routine and you never want it to be routine. You want it to be grounded. So um, th those are some of the challenges, but it's, it's an interesting journey. I think that happens with all art, all the mm -hmm. artists. It might be harder for a ballet dancer, someone, you know, who has this very high or a trapeze artist where almost life and death, depends on you know how what your physical you know craft is but mime is such an interesting art form because it does combine physicality and the mind so i think through time it can become richer you know by all means yeah um and i want to know now how modern dance fit fit into your early years <laughs> Um, because you you did study modern dance and it even shows in some of your early work, which which we'll get to in a minute. But if you could just talk about that a little bit. Well, I think um, we talked about the sports experience, which gave you this sense of wild abandon, you know, like aggressive attack, you know, in all demand, like basketball particularly is up and it's down and it's over and it's around and it's, you know, there's so many elements of physicality happening there. You know, a basketball fake is really a mime illusion, right? If you fake and your intentions are, I'm going to do this, it's really mime. And the person, the player defending you buys it, they go there and then you go there. I mean, it's the same process. So the modern dance, it's a very interesting story. So Bob and I were touring, we were in uh, in um, uh, Missouri at, at a college performing and there was a faculty member there on the dance was at Washington University, which is a kind of an Ivy League school in uh, in St. Louis. There was a modern dancer there who had been in the Alwyn Nikolai company. And the history of Alwyn Nikolai is that he was a puppeteer originally, and he worked with precise movement with figures. And he was very adventurous. He had a reputation as being a tap master, like all the 
his his dancers became puppets in a way. You know, he, he didn't give them a lot of leeway. The saying went, but the the um, um, this this faculty member said, "Wow, you should go study um, with Alan Nicola. I think you'd really enjoy it." And of course, puppets. You know, a lot of the puppet craft of movement is very similar to my movement. Very similar, if not the same, only, you know, you have an object versus a human body. So I said, I'll go. I was 20. This was right before I met Keith in the Washington Square. So I said, I'll go for two weeks. And uh, my partner, Bob, was going to get married soon. And he was still lost on the Lost Coast. And so I went to New York and I studied dance and the whole world opened up to me. And I found that I would, you know, it was totally new for me. Because growing up in a small town, we we didn't do the arts. We did sports. My mother was a choir director, and she was a, a wonderful painter. One of her paintings is back there. Um, so um, this sense of uh, artistic movement was very alien to me. But I was pretty good at it because I would sort of rely on my basketball skills <laughs> and these mind skills, we haven't talked yet about how I, you know, was introduced to that, but um, so the, the modern dance um, is an incredible form, you know, supposedly uh, American pioneers invented contemporary dance like Isadora Duncan and Martha Graham and the, these, these wonderful, you know, internationally known artists from the early part of the 20th century who were known throughout the world for this new form of dance that was not ballet. And, it, you know, it wasn't folklorico. It was it was a form of movement that sometimes in the older days told stories, but very athletic. There were no rules in terms of, you know, you had to be on point, blah, blah, blah. So that experience in modern dance, which I, I continued to study when I was a faculty member at the School of the Arts in North Carolina, which had a, you know, world-class dance department, I would continue to take classes even as a professional mind. But this sense of dance gave me a knowledge about the inner knowledge of my body that I couldn't get through sports. I, even now in sports, you know, people stretch and there's all this, these experts that dance has always had, you know, in terms of movement. So it gave me another um, channel to shape my, my physical theater work through time and space. I, and I use this word time and space, which is a very common modern dance term, how space informs time and vice versa. So this sense of time itself, you know, musical time, not playing an instrument, but the sense of what the rhythms of life itself are very much in force when you study contemporary modern dance. So that really upped the... the um, quality of my work, I think. And so, for, you know, for my whole life, I, I do a whole regimen of modern dance stretches, which I'm kind of lazy at now. There comes a point where <laughs> we might talk about that later. But uh, but that that's where that came from. And then, of course, the, the early work was there were some dance moves in there that fit with the mime. So I, I, I had been called a, a mime dancer occasionally. I remember the remember the old magazine, Dance Magazine. It was a very special publication. There was a feature on me in Dance Magazine once, and but I was a mime. I never said I was a a dancer, but they would call me a dance dancer mime because I would use physicality a little more than the Marceau kind of um, style at, at that time. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you, um actually study with a mime teacher ever i did for a very short time he was a japanese man named yas hakashima and he just that. recently died um mm -hmm. two two years ago i was going to i had offered to uh, perform my classic fish mime at, at a service for him because that he that piece is influenced by his work and um so yeah, when I was in college and I was making the transition from athlete to to actor, that's another thing that's important that about th this acting thing that we, I think we should talk about at some point. Um, so we had a, a residency for a couple of weeks by Yasakashima, who was Japanese. He had grown up in the No Theater of Japan, but he had studied Western mind. 
So he was a performer with a white face. And those of the audience that know about Japanese classic theater, there's the no and there's the kabuki. So there's the stylistic qualities of those forms really lend themselves to mime, if not a form of mime. So he uh, introduced us to mime, these actors who were in his workshop. And that's where I was really influenced to go that direction rather than just being a, uh, a straight actor. Um, seemed like it. So I had, I had a little training. But the, the thing was that we were behind the Redwood Curtain. So Bob and I, and Bob and I had been athletes. So we were used to practice. We were mm-hmm. used to daily, like a musician, you know, a piano player or a violin. You know, you practice, practice, practice through repetition. So we were, that was what we were used to. So we would practice the fundamentals of mime. And then we, because we'd only had little exposure, we were in a, a piece or two that Yas um, uh, created, but we took some of the fundamentals and on our own, we would develop a certain approach to it. So there's, I know there's some exercises I do and some methods I use that nobody else does. Yeah. If I haven't taught them, I mean, you know, there's concepts can be similar, but the way I, we go about that, so um, this regimen um, took us into the, these creative places and we developed the uh, Menagerie Mime Theater style, you know, like like you talk about the American Mime Theater where we had our Menagerie Mime Theater style. And uh, that was our technique. And then all these influences that come in. Then uh, pretty soon, I mean, there's this whole period of clown I was involved in, which informed the mime even more, you know, but we'll get to that most likely. So. Well, it's very interesting. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to focus on your fish piece. Okay. Um, <laughs> which there is a beautiful video of you performing it in what year on it's on your website. Yeah, that's 19. That's about the time I met Keith. That's. Okay. Well, maybe a, little, a couple of years later. That might be 75, 76, when that was recorded. I think, actually, when that was recorded, it was probably 1977 or 78. Well, but it was, created, it was created about 1973 or two. Yeah, yeah. it's it's really a stunning piece. And um, good for you for videoing it, f- finding somebody to video in those years, because so much was lost. You know, I mean, video technology wasn't great in those years, but... Right. You know, there was so much good work that just evaporated, um, as live theater is supposed to do. It's supposed to evaporate. But um, but having a video documentation, especially of mime pieces, because I find mime really does lend itself to the two dimensional um, medium. It does. It, it, it's beautiful. Video. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's it has not, not been explored yet. I don't think it's been explored yet, really. I mean, yeah, now I that we... think the pandemic's kind of kicked it into gear a little for some yeah. of us. Now, there, nothing compares to being there live, seeing a live performance. But this is really a beautiful video. So I, I do recommend everybody check it out on your website. Um, and in it, there's a just, I think, a perfect illustration of where modern dance can meet mime. Because you have real narrative elements in the piece, in the story, which keeps the viewer, you know, interested in a narrative way, um, wanting to see what's going to happen next. But there's some beautiful modern dance movement that um, it does not, it never looks um, uh, contrived or, you know, um, you know, superfluous. It it they really inform each other beautifully in that piece. So I would like for to hear from you about how you how you devised that piece. And it's very interesting to hear that um, your 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 one and only mime teacher um, was the one who who really gave you the idea to marry those two. Yeah. Dis- well, first of all. I grew up as a kid in Ventura County, which is north of LA, and I lived at the beach until I was four in a cottage. But my father was a man of the sea, so I spent hours on the ocean. We had boats, he built boats, he built marinas. I built docks in high school with a hammer and nail at Channel Islands Marina. 
which is uh, north of L.A. So I was uh, he was gone all the time fishing and we would go out on these fishing trips to the I- offshore islands, the Channel Islands. And, the, you know, all the men, I was the only boy usually of, you know, I started going out there probably when I was seven, six, seven, eight. You know, I was always surrounded by the good old boys, you know, like drinking their beer, catching their fish. And I was always looking at the landscape. So you say, there's no landscape on the ocean, but there is. The landscape is like the desert. You know, people say, well, what's in the desert? Well, you have to look and you have to recognize the space and you have to look at detail and you have to look at the the inviting. Like, I love the high desert. And I love the ocean because there's this inviting sense of the horizon, like what's out there. And if you keep looking, you'll find amazing things that fill your imagination, this emptiness. So I kept looking at that. And I look, I kept looking at the fish with all the blood and the beautiful animals and the scales and the slipperiness and the the, the stories of the monsters of the deep. You know, we'd see whales and you you're just like, whoa, your imagination would go crazy, porpoises. So I had that experience which informed my my texture for this a mime like fish and then i had the political point of view like i kept thinking to myself well how do the fish feel and most people will go what fish don't have feelings well they're animals right here this is the 60s again right so you're going like well how do they feel so then the idea is you know the chrysalis of the idea is well what a, what's the fish's point of view and then you get into one of the great, you know, stories of our time is uh, Hemingway's The Old Man of the Sea. You know, this battle, the, the metaphor of the of the marlin, you know, what that represents. Mm-hmm. So then you get that struggle of nature versus human, yeah, which is very powerful, right? I've always wanted to adapt Old Man of the Sea to a mind play, actually, you know, to flesh it out even more in a particular way that where I think I and my friends could do in a very interesting way, you know? So, um, so there's that dynamic. And then of course, modern dance is about space. Yeah. It's about landscapes and geography on stage, literal and not. So all these ingredients went into the, into the pool, into the pot and then the soup was an uh, uh, amazing soup was made. So it felt natural to me to do a piece like that. Also being from the North Coast, you know, all we have there is redwood, amazing, majestic redwood giants, foggy coastlines, tempestuous sea. So this sense of nature has always been in my soul. And and of course, you know, we all, the three of us grew up in California, right? Well, you grew up in Arizona, but saying it's the West, right? So the West is about space and sky and horizon right and even though you you grew up in la like keith did you still feel the ocean you still feel the the mountains around you and you still feel the sky it's a different kind of city it's not a high-rise city right so um i mean that so to to me the fish mime is a meditation you know at one time in my life i felt i'm going to do this every day in slow motion so it's mine it becomes mime tai chi yeah Mm. So it is combining eye-hand coordination of handling imaginary objects, of physical, um, uh, uh, you know, um, immersement in deep movement, and it's hard to do. Some I still do that piece, and you know, this idea of the hourglass is really at work because there's some moves I can't do anymore that are in that video, yeah. but I've adapted to it in a certain way. And some people have told me that I've seen both me over the last fifty years. They say it's better now. So whatever that means. So something's going on with the brain um, there. So, yeah, it's a meditation. It's a, I mean, I haven't really stuck to that, doing it every day. But every time I want to freshen up or, you know, loosen up, I'll do that piece. And it kind of wakes me up for a month. It's jarring mentally and physically. It wakes me up. And I go, oh, this is what mime is about. But yet, as you two told me, slow down. Okay, like find the moments, um, which is, you know, a thing for life, right? Smell the roses, you know, we, so same thing here. Yeah. Yeah. So um, 
But here's one other point about that piece. Yeah. I don't know if that can be done on the street. So getting back to this idea of the craft of mine, that's what's always attracted me is that's a theater art. Mm-hmm. It's an act, it's an acting craft. You know, acting you have to be an actor first. You can't just be a mover. You have to be know how to act. There has to be inner life. Yeah. If you're not a good actor, you'll never be a good mind. You just won't be. Right. So this fish mine is a salute to the like the, the flow of life itself on the theater in the, on the stage. I think it's about taking that theater space with a particular simple lighting, nothing around you, but you're in a controlled environment where the energy is all going into that one place. You know, there's no distractions and that's what makes it block them. And I think if you're outside, that energy will, would be lost somewhat, which well, is an and interesting. And let me just add one thing. There's also the silence. You know, you don't use music in that piece. Um, I do now, though, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, now it's a little different now. I mean, audiences are so, they so expect to have some sort of audio component that right. you, have to, you have to be in just the right environment to get away with with true silence. But but I mean, but I think that it really um, informs that piece in the way that you were just describing and making it a sort of meditation, because when there's a whole audience witnessing one single performer on an empty stage performing in silence, it becomes a spiritual experience. It's church like. Um, yeah, we worked uh, in the early days. We had no sound scores, not even, you know, live music, musicians we had because we we were concerned with the rhythms of life itself, like the bum, da, 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 foot, a footstep here, a breath here, a, a, a hand, you know, that's that kind of music is really, really important. That's the one thing I learned from modern dance is this sense of, you know, how, you know, things come alive, just, you know, how inanimate objects are, yeah. have soul, have spirit, you know. So this idea of silence. Silence is very noisy, as we hear people say. It, 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 <laughs> know what they're talking about. It's very noisy, you know, if you do it the right way. Right. When on the spectrum of narrative to abstraction, where would you say most of your work falls? It's a good question. I, uh, you know, during this the same time period, there's another video that's on YouTube. Uh, no, it's not on YouTube. It's called Scribbles, where I took a just got garab- in Spanish is garabatos, which means scribbles, you know. So I did a piece. It was a very popular piece. It might have been ahead of its time in terms of the mime doing this. It was it was more like a modern dance piece. Right. I should put some of these video. I should put some of this together. But there's it's sound effects, real sound, yeah. movement, and it's just me doing my own scribbles. I end up eating the curtain at one point. It's really outrageous. It's crazy, but people loved it. <laughs> and athletically, I can't really do it anymore. I could do a piece probably similar to that. So that I would say that was the abstract realm. But then I've gone all the way to to very narrative pieces. I mean, I think it depends on my age, my mood, and my 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 company, uh, my my friends. You know, who I'm working with, my company. You know, what where I fall. But I, I'll do it. I'll any all of it's interesting to me. I think the mime work. You know, well, you know, when you say mime itself, that's, you know, we haven't even talked about what what my approach to that, but it is a stylized poetry in motion, right? So you have to have a certain amount of abstraction to begin with or style or, you know, um, you know, life is absurd. So I, my, a lot of my work is dreamlike, you know, so I have, I just wrote a bunch of short stories, really short page and a half of dreams. I actually have and ones I created, what I try, I think I'm going to make a, in fact, Keith, you might want to be part of this and share it. It's, I'm going to mount these things with, with text and movement and blah, blah, blah. But so I don't know, to answer your question, I don't know where I fall in that realm. I mean, I've written plays. I've, I play yeah. music now. I mean, I don't know. My mind is just in, everywhere, you know, so I can't answer that question. You know, that's for others to answer. So let's let's move to the audience component. Sure. Uh, how important is the audience in your work? Do you feed off of the audience's energy? Yeah, I think it's very important. I mean, for me, if you don't have an audience, first of all, you're doing therapy. Okay. If you don't have 
the witnesses, the ritual. Hmm. I mean, we can have private rituals, but the the public ritual of a culture is present in the art of theater or, or any artwork, really. But especially in theater, you know, going back to the beginning of time, people did rituals of theater, became theater-like. In fact, you know, we all know the history of theater and music. They came out together as you know, very important cultural events that became more of an art form at some point. I had a student once that said, you know, she was from Africa. She said, we don't have the word art in our culture because life itself is art. Mm -hmm. Whether you're making a basket or hunting, or I mean, it's how you craft the weapons to hunt. You know, the, you know, the, all those tools are artworks, you know, like you make a tomb for your dead Pharaoh, you know, you make this incredible, shape monolith you know so so that that was fascinating to me there was no word for art we are we we manifest it every day in our lives so um this this audience participation has always been important of course that goes back to sports the crowd is incredibly important for a sporting event not only from their perspective but from the athlete's perspective you know that it's this bond, this this energy can propel you to new places. And then, of course, you have the clown art, which is a great rave now, um, mm -hmm. where the audience is always an integral part. And then you have the offshoots of stand-up. And you could say stand-up is an offshoot of classic clown. You could say that, I would say, you know, not the other way around. So you have this audience connection in fact, back in the 73, we had this very short piece called Pollution. And it was really simple, but it was one of our best pieces where Bob would stand in the center of the stage in a cone of light, like every man. And then this, this creature, almost like a cat, would slink out of the shadows and start prowling slowly around the figure of him standing. So that mm -hmm. was my part. And it, would, it was like a, a panther in the darkness. And it would circle and circle and then eventually it would come in and it would envelop Francisconi and, and crush him. And this we call this piece pollution. Crushes mm -hmm. him. And then the, the creature turns to the audience and starts moving slowly. Uh, and just before I would go off the stage, we'd have the lights go to black, right? Mm -hmm. But the but the audience loved that. So this the sense the I mean, even if the the, the fourth wall. You could say there's a fourth wall, but then what's on the other side of the fourth wall? So even when you're performing, like I just did Virginia Woolf in a house, right? Where, I, you know, where there's a fourth wall, right? But the audience is sitting across the table from you, maybe like a movie. It's the can't their cameras, so you can't look at them. But you, this idea of space, you always know. Like I worked a lot on film sets. And it was really interesting how the best actors would go, where's the camera going to be? Mm. That was their audience. So they would, you know, correlate where they, what they needed to do based on the angle and whatnot. So we as performers, you know, you can have close up, close ups in mime and you can have, you know, panning cameras in mime, you know, you can, you know, good mime is very cinematic and vice, vice versa, you know, in terms of editing, you, you guys know that. So, you know, I think, I mean, you don't have you don't have a theater event without an audience, so of course it's important. You described recently a performance you did, uh, a mime performance, um, where you had this great rapport with the audience. Are, are you? Are, oh, yeah. yeah. So this is interesting. I've had this happen to me tw twice. So we've all performed, all of us have had varying audiences sizes, right? I think my biggest audience was 2000. You know, I've never performed in a halftime at the Super Bowl or something like that, but, and then I've had audiences of six mm -hmm. and the audiences of the two times I had, I mean, I've probably had other, more than two times I've had audience of six, but one time was in a big hall like many years ago in Ireland on a rainy night. And another time was just last month in Cali, Colombia, in a 120-seat theater, beautiful little theater. Another rainy night. I don't know if rain has something to do with this, but I don't know if the soul of the 
cosmos is raining down on you to give you something. That's interesting to think about. You know, the, how stormy nights create a chrysalis for stuff to happen. It's very interesting, right? So both times, I think that was, they were my best performances for six people because it becomes more than a dinner party. It becomes like you're almost sleeping with them. You know, you're having very romantic wet liaisons with the audience. You know, it's very private and it's very intimate yeah. and the intimacy becomes profound. So, so I had this one experience in the nineties and this recent experience where I thought I did the best mind show, classic James Dolan style, classic mind show, the best thing I'd ever done in my life. And the audience was spellbound because they all told me so, <laughs> but you could feel it, you know? Oh. So this, uh, this, you know, in those moments, you kind of go, oh, I've been doing this for years. So now is my life a waste? Yeah, from my perspective, yes, is, is this a waste of my life? You go, no. So you kind of go to this place of, I'm going to reach deep and make it meaningful, you know, if not for them, for me, because it's a life well lived. So I think you go to those places and this magic happens, you know. Yeah. I mean, it truly does. You know, it's just, it's very, very, very interesting. You know. so, so you you mean when you see that there are only six people in the well, audience? Not always. I'm just saying that's when that happened. That's when you times of great accomplishment to your heart happens with a very small audience. Mm -hmm. You know. I have think. you ever had the experience where you you have a nice size audience, but they don't react at all, and you think you've you've just uh. bombed, and then you go <laughs> and talk to them afterward, and they they're just they're just head over heels. I mean, well, that's they, the key. Uh, that's the key to that's the key to the, the physical theater, especially mine. When you're young, you know, you're met with, as you all well know, you're met with these audiences. And you go, shoot, am I? Uh, are they bored to death? And I can't hear them. I can't feel them. What's going on? And you get really, <laughs> get really, you get really like shaken. And then you, then they say, "Well, we're in." And then you, you, you eventually learn that they're concentrating. Right. <laughs> they're just concentrating on you and they're just locked into you, you know, but it takes a long time to learn that. And even as an older performer, sometimes you get kind of, you know, when you're an older performer, you, you kind of can feel the room and you can even check out the audience without them even knowing you're, che they're, you're checking them out. You know, when you have some of those like magical skills you've kind of developed over the years, you know, those shamanistic skills, but it's uh, yeah, that's uh, that's very unsettling. And I think one of the reasons young performers maybe don't go the, the mime way is it's the audiences dissect you like, you know, you really are naked, you know, heart and body. They just right. dissect you if you're doing something good. They just go into you, which um, can be good and can be a little awkward at times. <laughs> yeah. I was going to ask you, um, how does teaching uh, all these years of, inform your own performance? Uh, that's a great question so for me i've always been a teacher in fact i started teaching mine before i'd even graduated from college they'd let me teach it for whatever reason but i like the way things work i i like to i'm, I'm not a mechanic i don't really like looking under the hood when i grew up in the 50s you know you weren't a cool guy unless you could look under the hood right but that never interested me with what, what interests me is that could interest me, but I, my father used to tell me, you always were looking at planes, boats, and trains when I was a kid. Mm. And, and those of you that know me well know that I have a fascination for model trains. Mm. And I have, a, I've, have, have several worlds that I've created around that theme. So I've always, I like the way things work. I'm really interested in the development of skills and and ideas so uh as a basketball player i enjoyed the practices more than the games way more i just mm -hmm. love the mm -hmm. sense of trial and error and the the small accomplishments and the light bulbs going off and the uh whoa i just i just did that or wow you just did that so um and then one thing I discovered really quickly is that 
Well, first of all, let me say my, my motto about how to be a good teacher is three simple things. Teach what you know, teach with honesty, and teach with passion. Mm-hmm. Don't You don't have to do anything more than that. So I always taught things from my own experience. So, you know, I do have a skill, a talent for mine in physical theater. So I taught that in my own way, but I also taught it very honestly, and I taught it with gusto. And the teaching forces you to think out your philosophy of performance. And then as a performer, you can usually do what you teach. You know, you, uh, you know, you have, you can back it up. You can say, Mm -hmm. well, this works because it worked for me and I'm going to help you to find your way of working through this journey. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've seen amazing performances in classrooms. I mean, I've taught from the very beginning, like at many MFA programs and at BFA programs and in professional institutes. I had my own school in San Francisco twice, the first time in 1973. In fact, when I met you, Keith, I was, I had my own studio called Manamaji Mind Theater Studio, and Bob taught with me. Both of us were teachers. So the workshop was always part of our offerings as young artists. You know, we do the performance, but you know, we have this whole other thing that's really valuable. And, you know, and so then we, we, we did a lot of performances in colleges and universities, because as you know, back in those days, they would invite people to come to do that. And if you had a workshop, you were even more special. So, um, and then eventually you get in a position like my first big job where I could really develop a curriculum was at the North Carolina School of the Arts in 1977. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> like my co-host Karen was one of my students going mm-hmm. back that far. So these associations, these are these um, relationships you made with people back then are still living on. There's several people I'm still in contact with and even making art from those times. But this idea of developing a program of two years of really finding the mechanics of a process is exciting to me. In fact, they offered me a a state supported mind school in 1979 at the school of the arts because the school of the arts is, was the first state uh, arts conservatory in the country, you know, like a Juilliard, but it's North Carolina government Mm -hmm. supports it. It was part of the university of North Carolina system. So, but I said no because I had, you know, I was young and I wanted to go see the world. But I often wonder what if I had stayed at age thirty, mm. you know, and and what what would have happened? Because this country really, besides the American Mime Theater, mm-hmm. I'm not sure there has been another mime school of any note. You know, Del Arte is close, but it's kind of moving more toward clown and other things. But I think the American Mime Theater may be the only school in the usa that i mean somebody's going to call me wrong i mean i know jeff goldston had his school and people like that but okay. richmond Samuel. shepherd i don't know if richmond shepherd ever had a school but it's interesting yeah. artists like de crew and marceau came to the usa de crew particularly to open a school and then they all didn't work out marceau wanted to open one in santa barbara de crew was in new york for a while then he went back to paris because whatever the climate wasn't right but So this, uh, and then Marceau says, I love this quote. He says, an art dies for the lack of schools. Mm. So I think it's true. Like like we're kind of in a dry spell of the mime art in the USA right now because there is a lack of widespread education. I mean, good education that we're training. Not that you have to follow a, you know, like a, a guru. I don't think that's necessarily right, but. This uh, idea of handing down information is very important to me. How do you hand down information? You know, that's how we learned, but it was handed to us by somebody, our peers. And so we, we're in that position now to do that. So I'll always teach. I mean, I may, may teach less. You know, then we get into the, this idea of what's old fashioned. Like mime is one of those art forms that goes in circle cycles. But I noticed there's a lot of <clears throat> announcements for workshops. Like clown is the rage now. Mm-hmm. It's the rage. But I'll tell you, and one of the reasons 
mime isn't so popular is the craft involved, the amount of work you have to put in to learn the stuff. It's like being a circus artist in a way, but with the mind included, with, you know, with the acting craft included. So what I find is um, it, you can learn certain tricks and elements, but to sustain a whole show doing it is extremely hard. It's another level. Yeah. That's right. And a lot of people don't either don't want to invest the time or they just haven't been exposed to the doorway to go that direction. You know, You're, it's right. I mean, everything in a sense. I mean, mine is interesting because, as Sharon said, you can see quick images, especially on in videos that are stunning, you mm -hmm. know, and then the whole hip hop robotics movement was influenced by my street mimes. So they yeah. took these Im these quick images, and you know, like Robert or uh, um, Michael Jackson with his moonwalk. That's a mime technique that yeah. Robert Shields says he introduced him to. Mm -hmm. So they take this image and it's suddenly boom, and then they make it an art form in itself. But it gets can only go in my estimation if the story's not there or the inner life. You can only go so far, it and then it becomes life. just just lounge music. After a while, you've seen one, you've seen them all. You know. Um, yeah. Right. Well, and there's not a there's not a library of mime plays. Um, an actor can no. put on a play uh, that somebody else has written. We don't do that in the mime world. We write our own material, um, and so that that you know brings in a whole you know different level of of difficulty and effort because the story really <clears throat> has to be good. Um, yeah, like these, uh, these small. One of the reasons mime is a is a dirty word in some quarters is in this country is because people bought into the images, and right. then people indulge the that performers indulge the images, and then we say, well, that's all there is, yeah. and then like anything, okay, that's all there is. How, how often? How often can you see this one thing? Right, and then you have copycats who yeah. don't do it as well, and exactly. you know. I think that's really what kind of put the kibosh on street street mime theater is that, you know, there were some, let's just say, you know, mediocre street mimes that thought, oh, I can just do this, that and the other thing and put a hat out and get some money. Yeah, and it gets uh, it gets aggressive. Like when you're in a theater, they come to you because they want to come to you. When you're yeah. a street mime, you have to be aggressive. And so you're going to annoy some people. Well, it's a fine line. Well, a lot of people have been annoyed. You know, but it's and, a fine line because you have to be aggressive right. on the one hand, but on the other hand, seductive. I right. mean, Keith, Keith was a brilliant street mime because he, 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 he got he me in his clutches back, back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. No, he, he made people want to come closer. Um, you know, he was mesmerizing oh. physically, but there was something alluring about his presence, you know, as opposed to, you know, attacking them. Yeah, I would say Keith and Robert oh, Shields are the two, the two, you know, icons of street mind performance in the USA. You know, I'd say you, I think you, Keith, and he are the top. You know, very different, I think. Oh yeah, different styles. Very different. And he went showbiz, and you went other direction. You know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I probably should have tried showbiz, but why okay. would you have been happy? <laughs> What are we looking for? Money? Are we looking for money? What are we? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> well, but the great thing about not, um, you know, reaching that degree of fame that Robert Shields reached in his early career is that every audience feels like they're just discovering you for the first time. Yeah. You know, every yeah. live audience it, it, when you're on TV, you know, and especially in those days where there were, you know, like five channels or 10 channels, you know, everybody saw you if you were on TV and then, you know, you kind of blow through your material, yeah. <laughs> you know, to this day when Keith and I perform, you know, we, we have that feeling that an audience member feels like they're discovering something for the first time, which is very gratifying. Yeah. 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 As we, we, as we said, the, the young, the child, the young, young person, they always are fascinated by mine. Yeah. Because the the basics of magical art is is there and they see it. You know, they don't have any 
nobody's been talking in their ear, making jokes or, you know, there's no pre-convention. They just see what it is. Like, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'm interested to know um, how the origin of MIME Radio came about. Um, did you have the idea? Um, were you and Karen talking about? Yeah, I think I had the idea. I think it goes, it, 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 it's similar. It's not similar, but it, it's related to the idea about the teaching. You know, I, I'm always interested in knowledge. And I thought in having been alive during the golden years of my performance, I mean, we really, those 70s, 80s were probably the gold. I mean, even people like Marceau started in 47. But then he didn't really become known until later, you know, approaching the 60s. But, there, you know, it's having lived through that, and I've seen some amazing artists that, I, like you say, Sharon, they're not recorded. They're no, not that many people have seen them. And I just think it's a kind of a duty of history to, I mean, I was also a history major in college. I After I quit sports, I became a, I flunked chemistry, so I couldn't be a zoology major anymore so, to go beat the Russians with their Sputnik. So I became a history major and a theater major. And, you know, I'm interested in, how things were and where they're going, you know, that conti- that comes back to space and time again, right? Mm-hmm. So I thought it would be, I think, I, th- I thought it would, we should chronicle and archive some voices, you know, for whatever reason, because nobody's really done that. I and- mean, I'm finding that there are mimes everywhere and there have been everywhere and I, we'll never get to everybody, but, you know, I, I'm not sure what the future of mime radio is, you know, how to expand it, how to, get some financing for it. I don't know. You know, I'm pretty naive about that stuff, but. Um, Has it gone on longer than you thought it was going to? Yeah. Well, I never thought about how long it would go. I have a list of people I'm going to approach to do some more interviews. I'm a little tired right now with it, you know, but there are interesting artists everywhere. Yeah. Fast artists. So it'll, it'll continue. I'd just like to get it into a more comfortable place. Yeah. I, or, or, or expand the audience, you know? So I don't know. Yeah, quite yeah. That. yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's just a fabulous um, archive. So, yeah. you know, you have yeah. to be a special person to watch it. I think, I mean, it's a little bit, someone said, Oh, this is pretty academic. Well, yeah, it is. Cause it's really gets into the nuts and bolts of it. You know, it's not a, entertainment well, it it interesting so, yeah That's what makes it interesting. and it's there it's a library now so you can just go and yeah and, you know, even watch a few minutes of someone's interview um so it's just yeah. it's just really a, a, a wonderful thing so yeah. here's something else i'm interested in james um after so many years of I mean, you had your partner, Bob Francisconi, in the early years, but but for many years, you know, you were solo, a solo performer, solo teacher, solo everything. And recently, you've done quite a number of projects with your very talented, beautiful wife, Alina. And I, so you've joined the ranks of married <laughs> people who work together in their art form. So how has that been? Well, first of all, I have to say, I've always worked with groups, too. Like, yeah. even from the beginning, I had a mime company. There always, You know, I've always enjoyed working with people. So I haven't been a soloist all the time. I'm always doing something with people. And I've had various companies. And actually, with Alina, that's not my first husband-wife team. I, my second wife, uh, Tonya, she, who was a big-time modern dancer from New York and all the big companies, She's a, she was a professor at UC Santa Barbara for a long time after that. She and I performed together, um, trying to mix mime and dance, modern dance together. So, um, well, how do I, how do we work? How does a husband and wife work together? Like, I really, you know, I really appreciate what you two said about you have some rules. You have some, like a contract almost. And I, I, we don't have that. And I wish we, we would, but um, it's uh in some ways, 
I don't, I don't know if that's unique. I mean, in some ways, that's the dream of an artist's life is to have a partner that you can share art with. So that maybe I've been lucky enough to find that connection. Mm -hmm. Not everybody can or continue that connection. Like you mm -hmm. guys have been working. How long have you guys been working together? Working together as, as artists. I can't keep trying. Since 1985. Yeah, I mean, we're talking what? Like, what was that 35, 40 years almost? So that's amazing. So I think, look at Paul Newman and what's his wife's name? The famous actress. And Woodward. I mean, there's other examples of this this kind of relationship, but I think I think it's very special and it's very difficult, of course, because I think you do need to set boundaries and yeah. how like like I said, I just performed a, a a version of Virginia Woolf with my wife Alina, George and Martha, and that was definitely affecting our relationship. <laughs> you know, outside. <laughs> and so, I consider the material. That's yeah. Right. So um or yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, it's still a mystery to me. I mean, I don't know if I can explain the process of working with your significant other, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a slice of life. It is like having a good meal, um, through the week, and some of the meals are not as good as some of the others, <laughs> but that's sort of like what life's like anyway when you're married, right? <laughs> You never run out of anything to talk about. That's for sure. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, Let yeah. me talk about this book for a minute. Yes, okay. I was just going to ask that? if you wanted to share anything you're working on. Yeah, so this is a new publication that nobody's seen yet. It's called Musings on Mind. And it's, this uh, person here is a young person from Ireland who was one of my students on Zoom during the pandemic. And as you... As you look at this drawing on the cover, there's some hands coming out of eye sockets and eyes in the palm. So this book is a, sort of like the journal of this, per, this Spencer Kane's experience in my classes with my fundamental mind work. So this image is fundamental to the way I think about mine. The eyes are hands, meaning if I just need to look at something and I'm touching it. And the hands are eyes. You know, they are, they do the same thing eyes do. The same nervous system. So in this book are all these very cool drawings and with the comments from Spencer that capsulize my teaching. And then I have some comments here and there, like almost like sticky. Here's a good example. This is called, this section is called templates. So th this is a like a sticky with my comments that kind of, reference what the work's about so throughout my talking about teaching throughout my life i've always been looking for a means to communicate what i do in a in a in a book form right and i don't i hate textbooks i was asked to write one like years ago when i was 30 years old but i i started and then i it was going to be published and i just said what am i why am i doing this because what i'm saying now I, i'll know more years down the line which is true so but this I always thought that mine should be is a graphic novel, right? So there's images, it's like a cartoon strip, right? So there's images, but there's adult material. And so this is kind of getting to that point of, well, here's something that is mine, but it's not a textbook. It's not a how-to book. It's more of a art book. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the way it's advertised mm -hmm. with the theme of mine from a particular perspective. So we're going to... Um, try to uh, start marketing this soon. But if anybody's interested, this QR code may not be relevant in a while, but if you wanna take a photograph of the screen, this will send you to the publishing house that prints this and you can order it and they'll send you a copy. Here, okay, here I go. Wait, hold it up again. Oh, you wanna do it right now? No. That yeah. should work. Got it. <laughs> Yeah. Got it. So we've got really good feedback. When I say we, Spencer is 24 years old, a really cool artist, but he has, he also has a young person's perspective on it, yeah. which is very interesting. And it's, the work is very contemporary. The drawings are very fascinating. So, um, so far we've had good luck with it. So that's one project that I can see working on. Um, the other thing is, um, 
I'm trying to organize and to spearhead the first LA mime festival, which you two are on the planning group um, in the planning group. It's so interesting that throughout the last 50 years, some really accomplished professional uh, accomplished mimes have been out of LA, have been born and raised in LA. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. So yeah. Yeah. for whatever reason, maybe we'll probe that at some point, but everything goes in cycles. So I think it's time to bring some of these great, and even to this day, there's some young people in LA that are really good at doing mime. So as well as the old guys like us. So putting together a festival in a theater space, the theater art, so people can sample the kaleidoscope of mine and and try to see that it's not what you think it is. You know, I think uh, one person mentioned, it's not really what you think it is. It's this and can be this. And maybe that's how the art form can blossom and have another season, so to speak, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah, we're excited about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it'll be interesting. They just had a physical theater festival in New, New York, York City, a new one. But I think a lot of that was clown. And I want to differentiate between. Let's talk about that for a minute, if we have time. Yeah. So I I have a period of in my life where I was a clown, uh, a theater clown, and one of my mentors was Dimitri, a famous Swiss clown who died recently, and he was uh generous enough, he and his wife, to set up tours for me in the 70s in Europe when I was very young. So he, and through other uh, artists like Seaboard Turba, who many people don't know from Czech, Czech Republic, you know, the, the clown craft is, you know, to be a good mime, you have to be a good clown and vice versa. And I think, unfortunately, in the clown world today, a lot of the craft or the the concepts of mime are not being utilized to make the work play better and to make it more theatrical in terms of, you know, in other words, a good clown is an amazing actor, the same with a mime. So the, the, all three of those things come together. The mime and clown are more physical, the mime especially so. But what I'd like to see happen is in this LA Mime Festival that it's a mime festival. It's not a clown festival, even though there's elements of that, but it really presents mime as a art form that people are not accustomed to seeing for various reasons. And I think that's important to be stubborn about that word. I'm sure we'll have our detractors and maybe, you know, but I, I'd like to be stubborn with that. We'll see where that goes and see what we can yeah. do with that, you know? So. Yeah, I agree. I'm yeah. I think if you have honesty and passion and creativity, you can do a lot of cool things. Yeah. yeah, but and and it also goes back to the thing you mentioned earlier of schools and even you know yeah. teachers. I think there are now a lot of clown teachers, but yeah, you know it's, it's 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 our job to insert mime into the conversation now and to and to delineate, um, and you know, teach teach. There is a thirst in the in the younger generation for. I think. You know, authenticity pure, in some ways authenticity in a, in a pure physical art form you know that doesn't involve a lot of technology that does not involve screens maybe not even sound right. um you know i think there's a, a thirst to go back to that sort of primitive yeah, pure, art ourselves yeah it's um, a pure form i mean if you you may rediscover what life itself with the seeds of life itself i mean that's where it all started but this art form, I think eventually human human beings will want the simplicity of of the truth. And mime, good mime is the simplicity of the truth. And it can be funny or not funny. It doesn't have to be funny all the time. It doesn't have to be sad all the time. It, it, it's the spectrum of human existence. But yeah. it's the truth because it's just you and your body and your imagination. And if yeah. you think of voice as a gesture and uh, movement as a voice, which I do, then you know, those elements can be part of it too, you know. Yeah. So James, what is, what would you like your legacy to be? Legacy. Interesting question. I think USA culture is like hung up on legacy in some ways. I mean, having been a history major, I mean, history in a way is about recording legacies. 
But it's so interesting how people forget so quickly. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not sure a monument is noticed after a while, you know, like a statue. Oh, that's that that's that statue in the in the park. Like, what what was it? Who was that? What, what, I see it every day, but who is that person? So I think it's more ethereal and more. I think the legacy is about spirit and energy. So this could be bordering on religious thought, right? So we all can all our energy and spirit is converted at some point into other forms. I mean, that's science, right? That's been proven by science. So the legacy, perhaps, is which makes me tear up a bit because it's very powerful. The legacy is maybe about handing down this information to the those few that had their eyes open to take it mm -hmm. and that they can give it to some <laughs> give it to somebody else someday. <laughs> so I think that's my legacy. It, it can't be defined, you know. I think it's uh it's felt by those who know. Beautiful. Yeah. It does yes. make me tear up. I don't know. It's some, somewhere in my soul that this is very strong for me. Yeah. James, you've given a tremendous amount throughout your life, and you have a tremendous amount more to give. I have no doubt. Thank you. Yeah. Let's continue. As they say in Espanol, sigue. Sí. Forward. Adelante. Seguimos. Yeah, seguimos. Yeah. Well, this has been wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we spent a lot of time minutes here. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, James, for really for um asking us to interview you. You're you're wonderful to interview because yeah. you you have a lot to say and you have a lot going on in your mind. Well, and the tribe, this is a ritual of the tribe, right? We're all we're the same tribe and the we're the elders of the tribe and so we're sharing important information you know that maybe younger people will look at at some point absolutely right all right all right thank you well thank you james thanks You're everyone welcome. for joining us that's it ladies and gentlemen mime radio show <laughs> over and out <laughs>